are subject as announced as better sacrifices. And this brethren will, will be spending a good bit of time in Hebrew, so you may want to have your Bible open. I won't have every text uh, in front of me on the PowerPoint as we go through this, or have your eSword at the ready, whichever you may use. Um, rather than the book of Hebrews is just so rich with lessons. And of course, it's there we find this phrase, better sacrifices. And our hope today, brethren, is that we have a deeper appreciation of the privilege of suffering with Christ and of being part of his body, which he offers. Um, and the privilege, brethren, it is so high of being part of that great priest that will bless mankind. And we know what sacrifice and suffering that the priest must have in order to be part of the blesser, the blessings to come. Well, friends, we're going to start with Revelation 5, 9, and 10. We wanted to share this because many years ago, before I knew the truth, I was a teenager, and I was reading through the book of Revelation, and I came across this text. This, of course, is part of the throne room scene where the lamb that was slain is given the scroll, the Lord's plan to understand from beginning to end, not only the things that were outside, but the things that were sealed up and hidden in that scroll. And here we find the 24 elders singing a new song, saying of the lamb, worthy are you to take the book and to break its seals, for you were slain and purchased for God with your blood, men from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests to our God, and they will reign upon the earth. Well, dear brethren, when we read this, our thought, we were raised in a Baptist church, our thought was that the few were going to heaven and the majority were going to hell. And when I read this text, I scratched my head and wondered, why would the church be kings, as other translations say, kings and priests and reign over the earth? Over whom would they rule? And what would their priestly ministry be for and for whom? Were these things just titles that were given to the church, or was there some purpose here? And dear brethren, um, the Lord called me out of darkness into his marvelous light. And one of the most blessed things to learn, I had read as a child um, all of the Bible stories. We had a wonderful book of children's Bible stories that really tried to hold very closely to the scriptures and not insert doctrines like hellfire and so forth. So I was very familiar with the stories of the scriptures with the idea that the priests had done all of the sacrificing for the nation of Israel. But dear friends, I had no clue as to the meaning of those pictures. And brethren, it is such a privilege to us today to realize that the nation of Israel was pantomiming God's plan for over millennia, dear brethren. It's just amazing how our father arranged his plan to hide it, and yet to make it so plain to those with the Spirit, um, his plan. And we're so privileged to understand these things, dear friends. Well, our subject today comes from Hebrews 9.23. And dear friends, if you look at the book of Hebrews, we're going to summarize this just briefly. Um, Paul reviews in chapter 9, verses 1 through 7. He reviews there the typical tabernacle, its furnished, furnishings, and he mentions the Day of Atonement sacrifices. It's interesting, Paul in, in Hebrews 9 gives us the type first, and then he takes features of it and explains it further. And so when we read this, it was therefore necessary that the pattern of things in the heavens should be purified, He's speaking of that tabernacle arrangement, those sacrifices under the tabernacle, all the features we find there. So the pattern of things in the heavens would be purified 
with those typical sacrifices. This is what he's talking about in Hebrews 9, 23. In verse 8 of Hebrews 9, Paul points out the antitype, and he tells us how much better Christ's sacrifice is than all the tabernacle ceremonies. That's verses 8 through 14. And specifically, he emphasizes the blood of Christ is so much better than all of these things. As you well know, brethren, those typical sacrifices could never take away sin. It required the blood of Christ. His life yielded up that all of those typical pictures, those typical sacrifices pointed to his sacrifice on behalf of mankind. So we find again verses 1 through 7, the type is outlined 8 through 14. Paul is pointing out how much better the antitype is of Christ's sacrifice. In verses 15 to 22 of Hebrews 9, Paul then points to Christ as the mediator of the new covenant and the need for the shed blood for the remission of sins. He explains its purpose. Then in verses 24 to 28, where we will have the bulk of our remarks, Paul tells us about the antitype of the priest entering the holy on the day of atonement. And we believe he adds in there the Leviticus 9 picture of how the congregation of Israel saw the sacrificing in the court, and then they saw the glory of the Lord. So, brethren, we're going to be comparing this pattern of things, or as the New Revised Standard refers to it, the sketches of things. Um, those ceremonies, which are so important under the Jewish law, were mere sketches compared to the reality. And so we find Paul continues in Hebrews 9.23 that while the pattern of things was uh, purified with those sacrifices, the heavenly things themselves are purified with better sacrifices than those, those typical sacrifices under the Jewish law. And it is such a beautiful phrase, brethren, the heavenly things themselves. Paul is really emphasizing in the book of Hebrews the higher uh, fulfillments. And we need to keep in mind, brethren, the, the book of Hebrews can be difficult to understand because it is really written to help the Jewish Christians understand that the law had been replaced, that there were higher and better sacrifices. And brethren, it, we find lessons that indirectly are talking about the church's covenant, but sometimes brethren have confused lessons in Hebrews to teach that the church is under the new covenant. But that is not what Paul is addressing, not directly anyway, in Hebrews 9. Brother, we like to emphasize here in Hebrews 9.23, there's a wonderful contrast between the word heavens and heavenly things. That the heavens, the word oranos, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, has the thought really of, of Earth's atmosphere that the heavens above the earth, so to speak. But the heavenly things, eperanos, that gives the thought of even higher heavens, that above the earth's atmosphere, above the sky. Doesn't that beautifully illustrate the difference between the type and the anatype? That again, these, these sacrifices of the Christ are higher than those typical sacrifices. And brethren, we find in Hebrews 8, verses 1 to 2, that we have this high priest, such a high priest, who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary of the true tabernacle, which the Lord pitched and not man. We see what a high and holy arrangement our Father made in providing a redeemer, and then providing for the church an advocate sitting on the right hand of the majesty on high. And here we find emphasized Jesus as a priest of the sanctuary, the high priest. And notice the true tabernacle. It's not that the Jewish tabernacle, the literal tabernacle, was an untrue tabernacle. But again, it was a mere sketch 
which pointed to the full and true tabernacle, which is of our Father's arrangement. Hebrews 8.5 emphasizes Moses' instructions about to make the tabernacle. Brother, it is amazing to me in the book of Exodus that we find such explicit detail given on the tabernacle. We find the instructions for the furnishings in um, Exodus chapters 25 through 29, great detail there. But then you find, as you go on further in the book of Exodus, the chapters 25 to 31, or excuse me, that's the instructions, chapters 35 to 39 detail the building of the tabernacle and its furnishings, all according to the pattern that Moses was given. Our father wanted to be sure that for his people, um, so many years hence, millennia after the tabernacle was given, that they would gain the lessons from the tabernacle and the pattern had to be kept correctly. So we find this detail. We like to think of this, brethren, that um, verses, or excuse me, chapters 25 to 31 are the instructions where chapters 35 to 39 are the construction. So you have instruction and construction both given in the book of Exodus. Uh, verse 6 in Hebrews 8 points out that Christ has a more excellent ministry because he is the mediator of a better covenant, which is established upon better promises. Dear friends, have you ever noticed how um, the book of Hebrews emphasizes the word better. It's pretty interesting. If you start looking, if you start looking for that lesson in the book of Hebrews, we could say that the book of Hebrews is about how Christ and his work are incomparable. Hebrews 1.4 points out um, that Christ is better than the angels. We find in Hebrews 7 verse 7 that the priesthood the Melchizedek priesthood, the kings and priests that were mentioned in Revelation 5. But that priesthood, that eternal priesthood, is better than the Levitical. Keep in mind again, Paul is trying to show the Jewish Christians they no longer are under the law covenant required to keep it, but better arrangements have come. Hebrews 7.19 emphasizes the better hope the hope of everlasting life, dear brethren, that it wouldn't be established by the law that men would be perfected and live forever, but it would be through the sacrifice of Christ that this blessing would come. Hebrews 7.22 and also 8 verse 6 emphasizes Jesus as the surety of a better covenant, the guarantee that as there had been a law covenant, it would be replaced with a new law covenant. And instead of writing on tablets of stone, the law would be written on mankind's hearts. Oh, brethren, what a wonderful expression of righteousness and all the fruits and graces of the Spirit to have God's law written on the human heart. Hebrews 8, 6 also mentions the better promises. Brethren, as we consider what God has in store for mankind, I think you grasp right away. If you look at mankind and what he longs for, um, you know, so many long for the golden age. They, they're looking for fairness in society and for people to get along. And little do they realize the thoroughness of God's promises, that writing of the law on the heart, how love will well up from every heart for every one how every sin, some sins have gone before to judgment, others after. Every sin will be dealt with. And if you think of that reconciliation that the kingdom will bring, dear brethren, mankind has no idea, very little idea, of what is in store for them in the way of blessing. And of course, here in Hebrews 9.23, the basis of this priesthood, of this covenant, of these promises 
are these better sacrifices? Now, brother, we wanted to emphasize here because it is remarkable. I read the scriptures many years before I came to the truth, and I had no idea how the New Testament refers to the tabernacle repeatedly. And of course, I was taught the Old Testament was uh, old, it was done, there was no purpose really in studying that. And so it was easy to miss all of the uh, references to the tabernacle in the New Testament. The New Testament is just full of these references, brethren. Every scripture that talks about the priesthood or about sacrifice, all of those things are pointing back to the tabernacle. And one of the plainest texts that we have, we find in Hebrews 13, verses 11 through 13. Now, this text, brethren, really emphasizes Leviticus 16. It narrows everything down to chapter 16 because it points to the sacrifices, and it mentions the beasts, which is more than one, but the bodies of those beasts whose blood is brought into the sanctuary by the high priest for sin are burned without the camp. So here Paul is saying there's two conditions. The blood is brought into the sanctuary by the high priest, and they're also burned without the camp. The bodies are burned, but the blood is brought into the sanctuary or the most holy. And of course, you see the picture, the sprinkling of the blood on the mercy seat. But there's only one sacrifice that meets those two conditions, and that is Leviticus chapter 16. So Paul is very explicitly saying to the Jewish Christians of his day, remember that sacrifice, which was so critical to your nation, that your sins were typically forgiven for the year ensuing by those sacrifices that were offered. And we do find uh, as you compare that with Leviticus 16, 27, that both the bullock and the goat, both of these had the blood brought into the holy place and the bodies were carried forth without the camp. So, I mean, here it's very clear what is being referred to. You just compare those two texts. We like to add verses 12 and 13 here because Paul points to Jesus that he would sanctify the church with his own blood, that he suffered without the gate. So he points back to Jesus and his sufferings and says, these are a fulfillment of that part of the burning without the camp. And then he goes on to invite the church to say, we should be going forth with him without the camp bearing his reproach. In effect, he is saying, um, you don't have to keep this sacrifice any longer, but you're part of fulfilling it. As followers after Christ, we should share his reproach. And in this type, this is going forth without the camp, bearing the disesteem of the world. You know, brethren, that picture we had, if you think about the burning without the camp, um, the burning was not in the camp of the hide, the hoof, and the duns in Leviticus 16. It was far beyond the camp. It really shows how the sacrifice of the Christ is disesteemed by the world. They want no part of it. They don't even want to think about it. Well, brethren, as you look again at the church in the tabernacle, and just hear a few allusions to how um, the church is put in the tabernacle picture. Brother, we think this is just very important. Um, as time has gone on, it has been easy to fail to appreciate the meaning of sacrifice and that privilege of having the mind of Christ to arm ourselves that we share in his experiences. But here are texts that, that plainly state that Jesus is the high priest of our profession, we follow after him as under priests. Hebrews 6, 19 and 20 references that our hope is an anchor within the veil, that Jesus, our forerunner, has already entered. So there we find that Jesus um, is the forerunner. The church then must be the afterrunners. 
And this is a direct reference to entering beyond the veil, um, to leave the holy and to enter the most holy. In the antitype, to leave the condition of the new creature in the flesh, of being developed and proven, offering the incense, partaking of the bread, appreciating the light of the golden candlestick, and that when our course is done, we follow after beyond the veil where Jesus has already entered. An anchor, brother. So wonderful. Hebrews 10, 19 mentions this again, that we enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus. Leviticus 16, uh, as we mentioned, um, the Hebrews 13 text, and there are many others, but we just want to really emphasize, anytime you come across priest or sacrifice, you find that that is a reference, when it's a reference to the church, it is a reference back to the tabernacle and the antitype that we're trying to fulfill. When we look at Leviticus 16, 15, this speaks of the goat that is offered like the bullock in that sacrifice. And it says that, that the goat would be killed and it is for the people and the blood is brought within the veil. And the same thing exactly is done with the blood of the goat as is done with the blood of the bullock. Now, as we look at that, dear brethren, uh, it's rather remarkable that Romans 12.1 is really a direct reference back to this picture because Paul beseeches the brethren to recognize by God's mercy and grace, the invitation is to present our bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. Well, Brother Edmund Jesuit loved to tell the story about um, how Brother Russell went to a printer with a story about the um, tabernacle with a lesson, I should say. And the printer, of course, is proofing the text. And he tells Brother Russell, there's a mistake here. You can't present your bodies, plural, a singular living sacrifice. And he tells Brother Russell he would be happy to correct it. Brother Russell, of course, says, no, that is exactly what the Greek says. And brother, this is sometimes hard to understand that the church could be part of the body of Christ, that as a collective group, you know, we make our calling election sure individually, and yet here it is pointed to as one sacrifice, that Jesus offered the church together at Pentecost is the point. And brethren, we individually present our bodies when we offer our consecrations to God. And in effect, we're getting in Jesus' hands at that point. We've come in to be part of the offering which he made at Pentecost for the whole entire church. Brethren, it's, it's just simply remarkable how the language of the scriptures is so plain on this point. So we'd like to ask the question, what are these better sacrifices in Hebrews 9? As you look at this chapter, Paul refers to three particular episodes. In Exodus 24, the making of the law covenant, uh, he references Leviticus 16, and he also references Leviticus 9. And we put a picture here for each just to keep in mind the differences. You've got the covenant, you've got atonement, basically Leviticus 16, and Leviticus 9, which is another picture of atonement is really about the glory of the Lord being revealed and the priest blessing the people. More on that. Well, brethren, keep in mind that the tabernacle pictures are like a divine gallery. And we love this point that Brother Russell makes in the tabernacle. This is on, starts on page 49. That each one of these pictures, Leviticus 16, Leviticus 9, uh, Leviticus 8, and, and others that are there, each one of them is separate and distinct and, and teaches a very particular lesson. But on that page 49, Brother Russell likens all of those pictures to a grand gallery of an artist's work, the body of work, that altogether you can see their related pictures 
but they show different aspects and they give a testimony unitedly of you know the artist's purpose and intent. And we find that in this tabernacle picture. Okay. And we would encourage the brethren, we put this handout uh, earlier um, in the chat, if, if you'd like it. But we found it personally very helpful to study each one of these sacrifices individually, as we mentioned, but then also to compare those sacrifices. And you find it, there are great lessons in the consistency across these lessons and you also find different aspects emphasized that are so helpful to get the Lord's total purpose in the suffering and sacrificing of um, the priests and how they pictured the Christ. Uh, Leviticus 8, of course, shows the sacrificing relative to consecration. Leviticus 9, um, Moses says early, excuse me, God says to Moses early, that the purpose was that the glory of the Lord would appear. It is very much like Leviticus 16. And we find, brethren, Brother Russell often explains Leviticus 16 and then switches over to the glory aspect of Leviticus 9. It's very interesting how he seemed to see those two pictures so closely together. Leviticus 16, of course, is the atonement day. We like to think of these last two, Leviticus 9, as the glory and blessing picture, and of Leviticus 16 as the mechanics of atonement, because it shows very plainly who is involved, which classes, in participating in the sin offering, and makes very plain that the scapegoat class um, is not, it, it's part of atonement, but it, in the end, it is not part of the sin offering sacrifice. Sorry about that, dear brethren. So we asked the question, was Paul mixing pictures? You know, when you look back at those tabernacle lessons, again, it's really critical to understand them individually. But Paul here mentions these three pictures in, in very short span and explains them. And it looks like he is mixing pictures. Well, of course, he is um, an authority, an apostle who was divinely directed to teach these things. So we have important lessons as we look at these three, these better sacrifice pictures all together. So we'll start with Exodus 24. And the most important thing about Exodus 24 is to keep in mind that there are only burnt and peace offerings shown in that picture. And of course, this is the a gathering of the people to the mount, to Mount Sinai, before the law is given, and the mount thunders and quakes and so forth. But it is in context with this, after the law is given, that Moses takes the blood of all these burnt and peace offerings. He sprinkles it first upon the book of the law, and then upon the people. So this shows the making of the law covenant, picturing the making of the new covenant, uh, with mankind. So it's, it's, it's just a wonderful picture, brethren, of how <clears throat> there's this grand picture of the whole world, but every individual uh, being sprinkled. Hebrews 9, 15 to 18 is where this is explained, that Jesus is the mediator by means of death, for where there is a testament or a will, there must of necessity be the death of the testator. For a testament is in force after men are dead, and then not even the first covenant was dedicated without blood. Remember, Paul is discussing the blood of Jesus and how much better it is than all of these sacrifices. Here we find he's emphasizing the second covenant, uh, the second law covenant, is dedicated by Christ's blood. It's really Jesus' blood that is used first for the church, but pass through them then for the world to be blessed. We'd like to emphasize here, brethren, because this is a confusing point. Uh, we find in the cup, when Jesus invites 
uh, his disciples to share the cup on the night of his trial when he established the memorial uh, for mankind. Um, he refers to the cup of the blood of the new covenant. Both the Mark and Matthew text, uh, Paul, Jesus says, this is shed for the many. So we can see how his blood, you know, is used for mankind. But Luke 22, 20 says that it is shed for you. We can picture him <clears throat> turning to the church, uh, turning to the disciples at that point, representing the church and saying, you know, this cup is the blood that will seal the covenant. It's shed for the many and it's shed for you. And it's on that basis, some think that the church is under the new covenant. Uh, but brethren, the, the scriptures say very plainly, Jeremiah 31, that the new covenant is made with Israel and with Judah. And it's very plain, it replaces the covenant that, that was broken. And not to go into the proofs of the grace covenant and the Sarah feature, just to emphasize here, that the same blood of Christ is used to bless the church first. It is the blood that will seal the new covenant after the church has been developed under the grace covenant. We have to keep in mind those covenants are so different. The law is written on mankind's hearts under the new covenant. The church, they don't have to have the law written on their hearts. They are willing and desirous of having God's law, and they're willing to be developed in this time of suffering and trial. It is a covenant by sacrifice. It is not a covenant where um, mankind receives the blessings without the trials, the sufferings, and the sacrifice. And we emphasize here, brethren, that 1 Corinthians 10, verse 16, of course, emphasizes that the cup is the communion in the blood of Christ. That's the King James. The New um, International translates that sharing. Other translations emphasize participate. And brethren, we say this because if you follow the logic of the covenants, just one last point here, you could ask the question, is the church developed under the same covenant as Christ? Is, are they Are they not? Uh, it is so plain we're to follow in his footstep. It's so plain that we're called to be priests, dear brethren. But as you look at that point, Christ was not developed under the new covenant. And he said himself that the church would were not above the master. They would share his experience. And that includes the covenant, the grace covenant under which they're developed. And Paul makes this absolutely clear in Galatians 4, excuse me, 3 at the end there. And of course, we find, brethren, in 1 John 2, 2, that Jesus is a sacrifice. He's a propitiation or satisfaction, not just for the church's sin, but also for the sins of the whole world. And brethren, one other point in support of this, it's very interesting when you compare the language in Leviticus 16 with Leviticus 9. Leviticus 16 is the one we always think about when we look at these sacrifices, that the offering of the bullock is for himself and for his house. And we know that means it's for his body members. Jesus didn't need to make atonement for himself. He was a pure lamb without spot. And then for his house would be those that are the household of faith who might come in consecration, full consecration to sacrifice. So we find there, there's this explicit division between the bullock for himself and his house, and then the go to the sin offering that is for the people. And we find that's really to establish the order of how Christ's blood is used first to develop the church and then develop mankind. Leviticus 9, it's very interesting in talking about the bullock. Uh, it's referred to as thy sin offering, which is referring to the animals that um, Aaron was to bring, and he brings the bullock for the sin offering. He does not, Leviticus 9, bring the goat. The people bring the goat. Leviticus 9, 7, again, referring to the bullock, 
it really combines and it says this sin offering of the bullock is an atonement for thyself and for the people. It's a very plain Christ sacrifice, his ransom is intended to benefit all, both the church and mankind. And brethren, in this discussion of sacrifice and the covenants, it's really important to keep in mind that, that Brother Russell, he was very explicit again and again. The church does not share in the ransom. That which takes away sin itself, the value could only be given by a perfect man an exact offset for Adam. But by God's grace, the church does participate in the offering for sin. They are allowed to offer themselves, not with the value of Christ. Of course, we have justification provided by his merit. It's only through and because of that that we have anything to offer. And so, brethren, it's such a privilege for us to share in that sacrifice. Our Father was pleased to arrange it. Again, always keep in mind, it's not the ransom, but the scriptures are plain that the church shares in the sin offering. Well, Leviticus 16, uh, we find there the sprinkling of the blood of the bullock upon the mercy seat. And again, the goat, exactly the same thing is done with that blood. We see the two classes represented in the bullock and the goat. And because we see in Hebrews 9.24, Paul is pointing back here saying that Christ has not entered the holy places made with hands. Again, he's talking about Leviticus 16, because that is the sacrifice where it specifically speaks of the high priest going into not only the holy, but the most holy. Leviticus 9 mentions Aaron going into the tabernacle, but it doesn't say anything further beyond that. And Hebrews 9, 25 and 26 points out the singularity of the offering of Christ, that unlike the atonement day sacrifice in Leviticus 16, which had to be repeated every year, that this sacrifice was done once at the end of the ages, really the end of the Jewish age, the beginning of the gospel age, that Christ appeared to put away sin. Now, this is important later, rather than remember this point. And there's a difficult issue here for some also, this point about once, that Jesus, you know, died on the cross. That was once, so there it was done. So some think that the bullock and the goat both represent Jesus' sacrifice. Well, brethren, uh, there wouldn't be under priests in the picture and we wouldn't have all this discussion of the church being priests unless there was uh, some tying of the church in the type. So Hebrews 7, 26 and 27 um, really helps us with this, brethren. We remember Brother Ken Rawson years ago speaking about how Paul says one equals two. It's kind of amazing. But here we find Jesus, our wonderful high priest, he doesn't need continually to offer up sacrifices. So this is the same point as back in Leviticus 9. There doesn't need to be that repetition of the day atonement sacrifices over and over again. But he does this once. He offers it first for his own sin, then for the people. So this he did once. Isn't that amazing? It is one ceremony on the Day of Atonement that has two parts, a sin offering of a bullock, a sin offering of a goat. And the emphasis here, brethren, is upon the offering. We said earlier that uh, the church was offered at Pentecost when Jesus appeared in the presence of God for us. Of course, his offering began at Calvary, or excuse me, began at Jordan and was finished at Calvary. But this reference of the Day of Atonement encompasses both of these offerings that Jesus did. And brethren, another text that really relates very strongly here is Colossians 1.27, which speaks of the mystery of Christ in you, 
the hope of glory. And here again, we find wonderful basis in the scriptures that to say that we are part of Christ, the church, the faithful sacrifice of the church is part of Christ. Hebrews 3.14 here, are the partakers of Christ. Romans 12.5 mentions individual members, but we who are many are one body in Christ. 1 Corinthians 12.12 is especially explicit that the body is one, but it has many members, that Christ is the same way. Brother, these are remarkable. I mean, I had absolutely no clue as a Baptist as to what these things meant. It was a mystery, and indeed, what a blessing it is. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Okay, so Leviticus 9, and we emphasized earlier that God told Moses, and Moses relates this to Aaron, that the reason for the burnt, or excuse me, the offering in Leviticus 9 is that the glory of the Lord may appear to you. There is a sin offering in Leviticus 9 very similar, but the glory of the Lord appearing is tied in with the consumption of the burnt offering in Leviticus 9. The burnt offering is, is just such a wonderful picture, brethren. It is a whole burnt offering when the animal is put upon the altar, and it is fully consumed. And that picture shows the full uh, devotion of the sacrificer to God. It's entire consecration on the part of the church that is emphasized in the burnt offering. And then the consuming of the sacrifice shows God's entire acceptance. And in the end, you know, the approval, the, the judgment that uh, this sacrifice was faithfully offered. And it goes on in verses 23 and 24 to mention, explain this, that the glory appears, fire from the Lord comes down, consumes the burnt offering and the fat. It's interesting. It seems like the zeal that is shown in the sacrifice is especially appreciated. And it's that point of the congregation, and this is an important difference in Leviticus 9, that uh, the congregation sees all of this. Um, they're invited to watch the sacrificing, of course, which is done in the court. Leviticus 9 doesn't explain anything that happens in the tabernacle proper. But when this fire comes down and they see it, they shout and fall on their faces. And there is a refrain, brethren, you'll find with the uh, picture of the dedication of the temple, very similar. The people see, they shout, they fall. And there is this refrain, the mercy of the Lord endures forever. That's the refrain of the kingdom that mankind will share. The mercy of the Lord endures forever. Very quickly, brethren, we have a handout uh, on this as well. Um, it's very fascinating, Brother Russell, when he treats Leviticus 9 in the tabernacle. He has four pages that discusses, you know, the everything up to verses 23 and 24, and then he spends 10 pages discussing uh, verses 23 and 24, which are about this um, you know, glory appearing and the people falling. And Hebrews 9.28 seems to be a summary of what happens here in Leviticus 9. It starts out in Hebrews 9.28. It's appointed, and we find that parallels the instructions that Moses is to give to Aaron, and then to men, the priests, really all the discussion in Hebrews 9 is about the tabernacle and the priests. That really ties in with Aaron slaying the bull and the goat, carrying out the sin offering and the burnt offering sacrifices. And then after this, the judgment, the judgment is really shown by the fire of God's acceptance, accepting the burnt offering. If we stay on that point, verse 26 again goes back to say that this sacrifice is once that Christ appeared to put away sin. Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many. This is where verse 28 picks up again. That as it was appointed unto men once to die, so Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many. 
And again, this tracks with the slaying of the bull and the goat in Leviticus 9 and the other sacrifices. And then Paul says, unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. And I think, you know, that's a very poor translation because Jesus didn't appear with sin the first time, but he appeared as redeemed. He appeared to give the ransom. He appeared um, to give the sin offering. And brother, this is shown, it's a little bit of a technical point, but Aaron goes in, excuse me, Aaron is doing the offering in the court. The people see Aaron sacrificing. This is the first time that we find, um, you know, mankind has been observing. Um, they realize that the Christians have been martyrs in the world. Individually, men have seen something of our sacrifice even though they don't understand it. So just as the congregation of Israel was watching the sacrificing of Leviticus 9, so mankind realizes and sees some of what the Christian experience means for true Christians. So when Paul goes on in Hebrews 9.28 and speaks of the second appearing, um, there are those who are looking for blessing and desiring the golden age. It is to those that the Christ will appear the second time, not as a sin offering, but for salvation. And this is shown by Aaron returning from the tabernacle. This is the second time the congregation sees him. And it is then that um, the glory appears. And Aaron and Moses both bless the people at that point. And brother, we'll just reference for time's sake, uh, reprint 5391 is really a classic on the difference between Leviticus 9 and 16. I have heard this um, referenced by brethren for years, and it is so critical that these two aspects of the sacrifice are given. One that explains atonement so plainly it doesn't ignore the blessing because in Leviticus 16, the priest does change into the garments of glory and beauty. It's just a, you know, a hint of the blessing where Leviticus 9 makes the blessing very plain. The fire comes down and Moses and Aaron bless the people. Leviticus 9 does not uh, emphasize, but it does relate the sacrificing uh, very similar to um, Leviticus 16. There are a few different animals in it that, you know, if this were another lesson we would go into. But we'll just leave that for you, dear brethren, that um, one question we had when we were first studying, how could Christ lay down his life? If the ransom was not taken back, how could Christ lay down his life and yet pick up life on a divine plane? Now, that's really explained in Leviticus 9. It was by his covenant of sacrifice that Christ could enter into glory. Oh, brethren, it's amazing how you could lay one down, lay down one life, and at the same time gain another. What a mystery that is to most, and yet your eyes recognize that point. And of course, Leviticus 16 shows the atonement for sin, as we've said, that that had to proceed before the blessing could go forward. And as we mentioned, remember that so many times when you're studying the tabernacle, Brother Russell will discuss Leviticus 16 up to the point where the sin offering and the burnt offering are given, and then talk about the blessings which are really specified plainly in Leviticus 9. So brethren, just in summary here, how do these better sacrifices relate? Why did Paul uh, put these pictures together? Well, we find Leviticus 16 shows that atonement again. Leviticus 9 shows the glory and blessing. And Exodus 24 shows the covenant sealed. What a complete picture we have of the purpose of the better sacrifices. May the Lord overrule anything said amiss.